Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, in the last lecture, we had uh, given a thorough uh, analysis upon what deep ecology is and uh, to what extent deep ecology was in fact making an attempt to find an alternative ways of trying to unearth uh, a deep ecological awareness and uh, we have uh, cited the works of uh, the Norwegian philosopher Arlenes and Arlenes strongly talks about the idea of uh, the eco philosophy and wherein he talks about that uh, self realization perhaps is uh, the best uh, idea which is posited in order to solve the ecological problems which we have uh, witnessed and encountered. And, uh, uh, in the last part of the lecture, we also talks about some of the critic how deep ecology is being perceived uh, in the third world countries as uh, an emerging neo colonialism. And uh, uh, today we are going to uh, uh, discuss about uh, social ecology, another trends of environmental ethics, and uh, which is developed by. Uh, an American socialist and anarchist, uh, Murray Bookchin. Uh, Bookchin, in fact, uh, sort of tries to uh, respond to the ideas which is developed by deep ecology, and he finds that deep ecology is not enough. Rather, uh, these sort of problems which we are addressing, that is, the environmental problems are something which is innate within the human society and therefore, uh, the human society or sort of how society emerges and the structure and function of society in a way is responsible and therefore, it, it has to be restructured and uh, sort of uh, uh, try to make sense of the kind of uh, stratification and hierarchy which exists uh, among human beings. So, if you look at the background of this social ecology, for quite some time uh, there has been uh, an increasing uh, realization that the dominant class that is the edit class who form only uh, maybe uh, a few a few percent of the entire uh, world population, but have been uh, successfully able to control and manipulate the natural resources in order to meet their increasing needs. And uh, therefore, uh, this has resulted to sort of a substantial or uh, uh, lead to some uh, consequences which goes up to the environment and this has advantage social groups. So, uh, therefore, it is interesting to see that how this class polarization emerges and why is it that some section happens to become uh, a victim of this uh, environmental uh, devastation which we are witnessing. And uh, if you, uh, you you might be familiarized, I mean, the, with the term called uh, ecological refuges, wherein there is a sort of a displacement and involuntary migration, uh, which which 
happens among communities who are closer to uh, and, and dependent on nature. Uh, as a result of many development policies and programs like uh, building certain infrastructures. But this has sort of uh, a far reaching impact on the means of livelihood or sustenance of those communities and therefore, uh, they have been displaced from uh, homeland and uh, ecological niche. And, uh, those uh, group of people are termed as ecological refugees, which in a way can also be uh, categorized as this disadvantaged social group. Now, for quite some time, uh, there has also been uh, a constant tussle which exists between development and environment. Why is it that when we talk about development, uh, it has a first and foremost impact on the environment is simply because of uh, the manner in which it is being planned and, and certain parameters are not being taken into considerations or, or for that matter those policy planners and uh, uh, scientists in a way are least concerned about the social or human factor and therefore, this has uh, sort of uh, lead to certain kinds of animosity between development and environment in general. Now, uh, earlier uh, before uh, this different environmental ethics or social issues were taken into considerations, um, normally it was uh, uh, presumed that the process of industrialization uh, was considered to be one of the major uh, factor which actually cause the ecological degradation. And also, uh, there are some school of thought who talks about science and technology as not something which will deliver or sort of deviate us from this disaster. And uh, also, in the last lecture, deep ecology is perhaps one sort of alternatives to these uh, uh, problems which we are uh, trying to find a solution. Now, today in this lecture as I said, we will be looking on uh, trying to explore what social ecology is and, and, and what is the kind of problems which are embedded in, in, in relation to the ecological degradation. Uh, which is pretty much embedded in a society. Now, uh, the term social ecology was uh, given by uh, Murray Bookchint and uh, Bookchint is an American anarchist and uh, libertarian uh, socialist. Now, uh, in his uh, seminal work Ecology and Revolutionary Thought, uh, he strongly propagate and talk about uh, this particular term or concepts called social ecology. And uh, social ecology is nothing but uh, the study of uh, the reciprocal relationship between human society and the ecological infrastructure. Now, uh, it is important also to situate this relationship which exists between uh, how the idea of uh, human sheer relationship with the ecology or the ecosystem around them. And then to what extent uh, this uh, dualism or boundaries have been developed and then what are the factors responsible for this uh, demarcation. Now, social ecology also in a way uh, tries to posit that the problems which we are facing is uh, perhaps the result of this uh, the kind of how society is being structured that is the hierarchical organization of uh, sort of the power relationship and the kind of authoritarian mentality uh, which is rooted in the structures of society. So, in a way it is 
if, if we try to from the sociological point of view, it is important to see this uh, from a structuralist perspective and how this uh, the structure which is uh, pretty much rooted within the society is also responsible uh, for this uh, environmental crisis. The western ideology in a way uh, which is being uh, sort of uh, supported by science and technology has this uh, perception of uh, dominating the natural world and, and which also perhaps arises from the kind of uh, social institutions which they have uh, emerges. Now, this domination of nature by man in a way stems from uh, the very real domination of human by human. Now, this idea of uh, how a human becomes subject of another human in a sense reflect uh, in a much more wider and it has a wider implication on the uh, relationship which is shared between human society and the ecology. Now, uh, this is something uh, which is uh, uh, talked about strongly by uh, Bookchin uh, in his uh, seminal work that is the ecology of freedom again. Now, what does social ecology in a way attempts to or tries to uh, sort of find an alternative in, in terms of uh, sol solving or describing about the environmental crisis. Now, social ecology in a way aims to you know uh, replace uh, the basic uh, attitudes and behavior that is the mentality of uh, domination with an ethics of complementarity. That is such an ethics also reflect our true role which is to create a fuller and richer world for all beings. That means, uh, wherein every species or every creation for that matter has a place that is uh, sort of uh, no, no division between uh, uh, different sections on uh, the idea of which is given importance and which is given least important. And, and in, in, in simple terms, this idea of superior and inferior uh, should be sort of uh, wiped out. Now, this ethics of complementarity has uh, to some extent a uh, spiritual dimension uh, that is uh, uh, so described by many of the social ecologists as uh, respir respiration of the natural world, but is clearly not a call for uh, sort of uh, a deistic theology. Now, why is it that the social ecologists uh, sort of talk about this the spiritual dimension which is pretty much present uh, among the uh, beings, beings of the natural world. Now, the sp spirituality which is again uh, at once by this uh, school of thought uh, in a way tries to uh, look at the uh, naturalistic rather than the supernaturalistic or pantheistic. Now, when we talk about spiritual dimensions, we are in a way uh, under the impression that uh, it is the supernatural or some mythical beings which we are uh, discussing. Rather, uh, this is something which is slightly different from the general notion of what spirituality is, uh, because social ecology talks about the natural world and the emphasis is pretty much on the naturalistic uh, being. Now, this alternative is society which is also based on uh, the ecological principles and organic unity in uh, diversity. 
and which is also free from hierarchy and based on mutual respect for the uh, kind of interrelationship of all aspects of life. Now, as I said, uh, every being has a place uh, and a role to play and, and uh, it is strongly guided by this idea of biocentrism and uh, rather than anthropocentrism. And uh, how uh, a particular uh, species in a way is also given an importance in the whole uh, cosmology. The kind of uh, understanding which is developed that is uh, on the principles of uh, the organic unity in diversity. So, with so much of differences and uh, of species uh, including the human beings, there is yet a kind of unity or a kind of mutual dependence among all these beings. So, therefore, uh, one cannot single out uh, that a human in a way has sort of an overriding or dominating power on this species. Now, the way human beings in a way deal with each other as social beings is crucial in trying to understand and making sense of the ecological crisis, because uh, it is the way we human uh, sort of treat other human beings uh, to some extent has uh, uh, developed that idea and uh, the how, how we deal with other human beings is also perhaps reflect, reflected uh, strongly on the other beings. Now, therefore, if we change uh, human society, by changing uh, society we are not talking about uh, the uh, sort of from a civilizational understanding, but rather from uh, the kind of mentality and the social structure which we are talking about, for instance, free from a hierarchy and based on mutual respect. Now, perhaps if uh, there is some, some kind of uh, a restructuring of human society, then possibly our relationship with the rest of nature will in a way be transform. Therefore, social ecology in a way talks about uh, a social revolution or a revolutionary change, which perhaps might be able to restructure uh, or transform uh, our relationship with the nature. That is, uh, it is ideal and important to separate the ecological problems from uh, the social would be perhaps a mistake or a misconstruct, because uh, often times uh, we only talk about the industrial, the technology, the society and so on and so forth by sort of uh, excluding the social problems and, and therefore, to sort of uh, exclude the social would be uh, a misconstru for the uh, for the factors which is uh, responsible for the growing environmental crisis, and therefore social ecology gives a lot of emphasis and importance uh, of the social that is the society. Now, uh, some of the key principles of social ecology is that uh, ecological problems there there has been. Uh, it has espoused that ecological problems arises from, from these uh, deep seated uh, social problems. And, and what are these social problems? Uh, we will we'll come to that uh, in the later part of the discussion. Now, the kind of uh, ecological problems which we encounter perhaps cannot be truly uh, understood uh, without. Uh, sort of talking or discussing these social issues. Therefore, uh, it is important to sort of locate and talks about 
the social issues which is pretty much inherent within the social structure of uh, the human society. Now, this uh, some of the uh, deep seated social problems uh, could be the social hierarchy and uh, the class le legitimizes uh, our domination of the environment and underpins the consumer system. When we talk of the consumer system, it is pretty much guided by the idea of this uh, market system and uh, perhaps uh, the capitalist mindset uh, of sort of exploiting nature and accumulation of wealth could perhaps be one of the uh, starting point uh, to begin with. Now, uh, there could be a lot of uh, causes to these environmental problems and, and, and from the viewpoint of this the consumer system, uh, uh, it, it can be the trade of pro for profit, the industrial expansion and identification of progress uh, with corporate self interest. Now, when we talk about the corporate self interest, it is also important to see that how uh, development is linked with environment. Now, for instance, uh, in the context of India and if you talk about the Vedanta mining, now what, what is the problem in the extraction of the aluminum or bauxite from the Nyamgiri hills and then what sort of repercussion does it cause to the people of mostly the Dongria Khand, uh, which is perhaps one of the uh, primitive tribes of uh, Orissa or Western Orissa for that matter. Now, over there, uh, the Orissa state government in a way has signed a pact with the Vedanta Mining Company and uh, many of those uh, Adivasis were in a way being displaced from those areas uh, for to sort of uh, excavate or uh, extract the mining ores. Now, if you look at many of those uh, mountains and hills not only sustain the uh, Adivasi community, but also it, 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 it is sort of sacred to them and uh, based on their mythical belief uh, those hills and mountains are in a way being uh, a custodian and have been uh, sort of a socio-cultural, a deep socio-cultural connection is being maintained. Now, the problem when is sort of the corporate in a way uh, intervent into extraction of mining. The development in a way is not just affecting the environment or the ecosystem of those uh, communities who are dependent on them, but it has also a far reaching impact on the uh, not just the means or way of life, but also a threat to the social and cultural identities of those communities. So, therefore, when we talk about uh, any environmental problems, it should not be seen as something uh, the problems which or the kind of degradation or devastation it causes externally, but it has one, one needs to give an in-depth analysis of to what extent uh, those development in a way goes to uh, the environment. Now, uh, books in, in a way from the perspective of this consumer system has sort of uh, highlighted uh, one of the some of the problems uh, of these uh, factors which is responsible for the environmental problems which in a way is uh, based on trade for profit. Uh, for your information, uh, when we talk about trade, it is not that trade does not exist in the past. Trade does exist, but 
to sort of satisfy the needs of uh, two uh, entity or uh, two groups of people by exchanging in order to fulfill their needs. But when we talk about trade for profit, it has sort of a far reaching impact on the environment and ecology again and also the industrial expansion and identification of so called progress uh, led by the corporate interest, uh, corporate self interest has in a way has a deep impact on the ecological problems. And social ecology in a way emphasizes that the destiny of human life uh, or the idea of existence of human goes hand in hand with the non-human world. Now, therefore, uh, it, it espouse sort of uh, a harmonious relationship between in the for the survival of human it is important to have a harmonious relationship with the non-human world. Now, as I uh, discussed in the beginning, it, it, it has some sort of a spiritual dimension, but it is to be located within the uh, naturalistic uh, perspective. Now, social ecologists in a way believe that things like racism, sexism, third world exploitation are in fact uh, a product of uh, the same mechanism that cause uh, for example, the rainforest uh, uh, devastation. Now, to think it aptly, I mean, the, it, 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 it sounds sort of like nonsensical to talk about racism and sexism and third world exploitation uh, in the context of this environmental crisis or the uh, devastation of resources. But Yet, uh, Bookchin in a way, uh, you know, calls for certain kind of uh, a holistic approach uh, in order to have uh, an, an ecological sensibility that would in a way uh, sort of shift our attention or uh, encourage uh, play and sort of uh, celebrate our imagination. And, and Bookchin in a way also claims that most uh, ecologists and environmentalists focus on the symptoms of our problems uh, rather than the causes. So, mistakenly focus on technology or population growth. Now, for instance, uh, po pollution in a way is sort of seen to be a major problem uh, in the present in recent times, but why is pollution so much talk about? Because it happens to sort of uh, posit a health concern to many of the developed nations or those uh, uh, elites. Uh, and, and, but when we talk about pollution, it also has a different connotations uh, in the third world countries, because uh, pollution of the water bodies, pollution of the uh, natural surroundings in a way has a much more or far reaching impact on uh, those uh, the marginalized sections of people. How? Because it is not just about the health concern, but rather it has uh, hampered the means of livelihood to those uh, communities. Therefore, this notion or understanding of pollution uh, perhaps might be a problem, but it has a different connotations and meanings to different sections of the society. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why books in, in a way has tries to focus on the uh, social uh, problems that is the kind of hierarchy which exists and, and to what extent uh, those elites are in a way being able to have uh, a dominating uh, nat I mean idea on uh, nature and natural resources. Now, therefore, it is important to highlight uh, not just the uh, negative effects of these problems, but rather to unearth the causes 
uh, which has perhaps been ignored uh, till now. Now, therefore, since the focus is on uh, to find out the causes, uh, it is important to see uh, uh, that uh, to locate the change in society. That is, uh, there is a sort of a clarion call for changing society, because the sort of soft technologies uh, or maybe let us say science and technologies would not make any difference either, because simple technology uh, which we are uh, sort of talking when we talk about sustainable development, it is important to accommodate the knowledge of uh, people who have uh, closer to nature. And, and who has been dependent on simple technology and, and books in ha over here has a different uh, take, because he feel that simple technology can still cause a harmful impact on the environment, because if the ideology that use uses it is unchanged. So, therefore, for books in it is the mindset, the ideology that is the ideas which is entrenched on the social structure uh, is responsible therefore in its change. Now, he uh, highlighted about the cited examples of uh, the period uh, 100 years ago in the uh, forest of England, where in a way cut down uh, with the use of simple technology like uh, the axis that had not changed since the brown age. Now, therefore, it is not the technology which we use uh, which is responsible for the environmental problems, but it is the ideology that is the mindset which needs to be changed and, and perhaps that would be the starting point for changing the society. Now, uh, uh, the current environmentalism uh, focuses mostly on the uh, environmental engineering that is concerned with tinkering with the existing institutions and values, uh, then changing them. Now, therefore, environmentalism is used to you know win uh, large constituencies, uh, but uh, not to educate them. Therefore, it is important uh, that Apart, uh, similar to the line of self-realization, which is uh, strongly adhered by uh, in deep ecology or deep ecological movement, it is important to uh, have certain kinds of uh, education to educate for change. Now, therefore, this is something uh, the environmentalism or the environmental ethics should focus upon. It. Now, let us try to uh, uh, look on the how uh, human society and uh, nature are so, sort of closely linked and the kind of relationship it is shared. Now, for quite some time uh, in, in different successive stages of society, there has been a continuous struggle for existence. And in this, uh, there are also some uh, who come up with uh, the evolutionary ideas, uh, which, which like uh, social, um, and, uh, Charles Darwin, uh, which, which strongly adhere to the idea of survival of the fittest, uh, tends to explain that uh, the increasingly subjective and uh, more flexible beings are capable of dealing with environmental changes for effectively than are less subjective and flexible beings. Now, in a way uh, uh, we can uh, say that human beings perhaps is uh, the most capable species which is more adapted or adaptable to any kind of environment and it, it, it tends to change depending on the environment one is exposed to. 
and and therefore it is not the strong or which is able to do who is going to survive but who is capable of uh, you know adapting and then changing that is sort of the strategy uh, in order to have to survive in this uh, environment now if we try to take the examples of the non human nature that is uh, its its process of evolution rather than as a mere vista now uh, uh, if if it is not that uh, the non human entity or nature also doesn't uh, evolve books in in a way emphasizes that human beings are basically just highly intelligent primates in compared to the other uh, uh, species why is it so because uh, is it because humans are more uh, prone to adaptation or rather are they more uh, receptive to any kind of environmental changes no doubt uh, human in a way are perhaps uh, in, in, in terms of the intelligence level perhaps they are uh, highly equipped with it we are also in a way a part of nature and suggestion that we are in a way a special case superficial and potentially misanthropic now why is that Bookchin is having such kind of observation and uh, uh, suggestion uh, because human beings in a way uh, tends to depict aliens that have no place or pedigree in natural evolution or to see them essentially as uh, an infestation that uh, parasitizes a highly anthro anthropomorphic version of the planet that is Gaia what uh, Bookchin uh, has given uh, the term called Gaia. Uh, the way these parasitized dogs and cats is bad thinking not only bad ecology. Now, Bookchin in a way depicts human being as sort of aliens in the entire uh, natural setting or the natural evolution and, and then perhaps uh, this is something how human positioned oneself in the natural setting. Now, how do we position human as part of the evolutionary processes then? Now, far from being unnatural, humans are in a way an expression of uh, deep natural processes. How? Because Bookchin believes that human consciousness is uh, nothing but a result of nature striving for uh, increasing complexity and uh, awareness and, and uh, humans are nature that has become self aware. We human in a way has sort of from the civilizational perspective if you look at we have moved on and tends to uh, sort of uh, develop our culture the kind of uh, belief system which we have and we, we tend to perceive ourselves uh, positioning ourselves in this part of this evolutionary process as becoming much more finer and finer and moving on from a simple to much more a complex states and, and this sort of uh, movement in a way is seen to be uh, because of the increasing uh, uh, self awareness and and even though we are part of this uh, biological evolution which Bookchin call as nature we still have sort of uh, a unique social awareness which uh, he call as the second nature now why is it that humans are in possession of this second nature and and what does this second nature constitute our second nature in a way is uh, that 
the development of technology, science, uh, various social institutions and also the uh, expansion of urban as a result of uh, uh, say population or this expansion of these towns and cities. All these uh, factors are in a way uh, dependent, dependent on the human abilities that evolve from first nature. So, in a way we move on from a first nature to the second nature and, and I am sure you are aware about how uh, all these factors add up to uh, being part of the second nature of human beings that is uh, from a evolutionary and a civilizational perspective. And there are still some human communities who still are pretty much part of the first nature and, and uh, who are not part of the second nature. So, that sort of dichotomy still exists even among the human society. For instance, many of the aborigines or the native societies or let us say the primitive tribes in India have in a way uh, sort of not evolved yet or, or, or we can in a way say they are, they are being left behind in this evolutionary process. Now, how then uh, in this uh, moving to the second nature, how this problem emerges and the ideologies they produce, the modes of thinking, the sort of uh, uh, priorities uh, which in a way is guided by the consumer system that is the trade for profit and uh, sort of uh, how uh, technology is being utilized in order to satisfy their needs or the expansion of trade. Now, the ideologies they produce the extents to which uh, this uh, contribute to this bi biotic evolution or aborted and the damage they have uh, inflicted on the uh, earth as a whole lie at the very heart of the uh, modern ecological crisis. Now, in a way uh, it is not just the uh, problems which we created. The problem lies not uh, uh, in, in, in terms of the technology which we use, but the problem as we discuss lies very much in the ideology which we uh, propagated. Now, Bookching in a way rejects uh, that either or thinking behi uh, behind the commonly hailed uh, opposites to anthropocentry and biocentry. Now, the opposing principle uh, that is biocentricity claims that all beings have equal intrinsic value and is bound up with the notion of a biocentric democracy which Bookchin described as almost meaningless. Now, what then is the solution? Is this biocentricity which is uh, in opposition to anthropocentry uh, the only solution or uh, what else could be the solution. Now, perhaps it is because of this that uh, Bookchin talks about or uh, popularizes this idea of social ecology, because social ecology in a way attempts to integrate that is the first biotic nature with the second nature that is uh, human society and non-human nature are in a way connected and uh, they are part of uh, one single evolutionary processes. Because when we talk about the evolutionary processes, there is a tendency to you know demarcate the uh, idea that human, human and non-human have share a separate root or separate entity, but the idea of social ecology 
uh, tries to espouse here is to integrate that is the bio biotic nature with the human nature that is the first and the second second and therefore uh, the idea is to sort of not just locate the intrinsic value but also to bring the non-human into the human fold as uh, following one single paradigm. Now, uh, the notion of this decentralization uh, tends to look at how we tends to pursue a sort of an interpretative meaning in the social issues, how it is being structured. That is, we should want to know how its idea derived from others and is part of an overall development. Now, what is this interpretative meaning? Now, if we are to understand or unart the intrinsic and in-depth meaning of something, one needs to uh, locate and study things uh, in, in its context, in its ecological space, in its socio-cultural setup. Now, therefore, only then we will have a sort of uh, a meaningful understanding of uh, the real nature and social issues which are so much institutionalized. Now, social ecology again sort of uh, urge us to uh, locate nature and society as something which is uh, pretty much uh, with, with share uh, a linkages by evolution into one nature that uh, consists of two differentiation that is first uh, which is the biotic nature and the second that is the human nature. Now, why is it that uh, biotic nature and human nature has to be club together and to be seen as uh, uh, one single evolutionary flow, because human nature and uh, biotic nature share an evolutionary potential for greater subjectivity and flexibility. And second nature is the way in which human beings as flexible that is uh, perhaps equipped with highly intelligent uh, and uh, which inhabit the natural world. That is to say that people create an environment that is more suitable for their mode of existence. Now, here again the question of uh, adaptability and adaptations comes into play again. Why? Because uh, human, because of their uh, basic advantage of being the most intelligent among the primates are able to you know refashion and create a space uh, which is uh, perhaps well suited to serve their own interests or modes of existence. Now, what are the environmental changes which are again produced by human and, and what sort of factors are responsible? Human in a way act upon the environments with uh, a considerable uh, technical foresight, uh, because we, we tend to evolve and modify the kind of technology which we uh, used. And therefore, uh, there is a lacking of foresight uh, may be in terms in respect to the ecological respects. Now, we, we tend to you know uh, put a blind eye rather on the ecological parameters and, and tends to focus uh, mostly on the technical aspect. So, therefore, uh, giving much more uh, priorities only on the technical aspect uh, again uh, has a far reaching impact on the uh, environment. Now, as we all know, you know the human society is pretty much guided by the cultural belief and system and, and cult, culture uh, is something which evolve 
over a period of time, uh, which is not similar in uh, different societies, because some uh, cultural group are seen to be, you know, much more uh, civilized and advanced, and whereas some uh, cultural co groups are seen to be, you know, uh, much more uh, inferior and then uncivilized. Now, why is culture given importance here? Culture again are rich in knowledge, experience, uh, cooperation, and conceptual intellectuality. However, the situation arises that they might be sharply uh, sort of divided against themselves at certain points of their development as one evolve, even when we are following that paradigm of evolutionary process. There is sort of a division again could be because of uh, a conflicts between groups, classes, nation states and even city states. So, there were times when the people who uh, inhabit a hill and a valley and, and so is today. Now, many of the hill communities or those native societies were seen to be uh, communities who are uh, far away from civilization because uh, they are not part of the state or the government and, and they are not uh, part of the so called civilizational perspective of this development. But uh, we cannot override by simply saying that those who are uh, far away from the state are to be seen as uncivilized or uh, rather giving that term called savage, because uh, recently uh, there is an environmental historian uh, by name called James Scott, who has extensively studied many of the South uh, East Asian countries and come up with the term called Jumia. Now, this particular term called Jumia is uh, given to those communities in different countries who have in a way inhabit the hilly terrains. And uh, if we try to look at history, uh, these people who inhabit the hilly terrains are practicing uh, an uh, the shifting cultivation or zooming practices. And this sort of uh, agriculture again is seen to be primitive uh, if, if we try to you know evaluate from the perspective of this trade and profit or the consumer system, but James Scott uh, in a way strongly argues that uh, these uh, communities are to be seen as state ev ev evading people, because they have purposely evade the uh, valley if not the state, uh, because they want to retain their own uh, distinct cultural and social identity, therefore they want to maintain or stay or isolate and detach from the state. Now, how do we then try to you know talk about uh, different cultural groups in different uh, ecological niche that what are the kind of divisions and how do we categorize that one sort of uh, cultural groups are much more superior and civilized and uh, the other group as which was supposedly called uh, state evading people as primitive and uncivilized. So, these are something which in a way has evolved uh, over time. If you look at, if you locate the historicity of how human society developed and uh, these are to be also located in the context of how human maintained uh, the sort of relationship with their environment and why do they stick to that particular modes of agriculture practices, which are seen to be from a colonialist or from a scientific point of view as something which is uh, sort of primitive and uh, uncivilized. Now, this is something which also has to be you know 
uh, not directly relevant, but to broaden our thinking, we need to be concerned about all these things as well. Now, non-human beings are generally perceived to live uh, in the certain geographical and ecological needs. Their behavior are pretty much conditioned uh, by the instinctive drives and uh, conditioned reflexes. Now, uh, animals usually or the non-human are seen to be much more guided by you know their in instinct, their sort of uh, they are they are much more reflexive. So, but but does that does that amount to uh, the non-human as uh, lacking in intelligence? This is something which we need to question. Human societies are bonded together by institutions that change radically over centuries. And uh, uh, as they developed from a sort of uh, a simple society to a complex and then the so called modern society which we are into, the kind of authority or the governing bodies also evolve over time. Now, non-human communities are notable for, known for their fixity, that is they are pretty much rigid in general terms or by clearly preset of and genetically imprinted rhythms. They are sort of being pretty much uh, inherent and, and uh, guided by these traits, which is again uh, slightly different from the humans. Human communities are uh, on the other hand uh, conditioned by the ideological factors that are subject to change conditioned by those factors. Now, if you look at uh, the sort of the past history, certain ideologies has been developed by different philosophers over a period of time and these ideologies in a way conditioned human society or on the other hand as society evolved and developed those philosophers were in a way able to you know interpret by uh, putting those uh, social economic and political affairs of that period of time in a nutshell by developing certain kind of uh, ideas or ideology. Now, uh, perhaps by now we are clear that uh, what are the traits which in a way influences or inherent to the non-human and uh, on, on, on what context uh, the human uh, society is different from the non-human.